Welcome everyone to another episode of the Couple News Podcast here at the Couple Nurses Studio. You got my buddy Matt Sautrek and myself, Peter Fendera. Another fun-packed episode. But first, thank you for all our subs. Thank you for all the followers that we have on our platforms. If you're on YouTube, make sure you, you know, like all our videos. We got some cool vlogs coming out. Check out the couple nurses, nurses.com for all the show notes. And we are flywarriors.com as well for some cool merch and just some really cool content. And make sure you guys give us a rating on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and leave some comments on YouTube. Appreciate so, you guys. I'm doing good, man. We just watched a video. We watched uh, a couple of TikToks before. It's actually very addicting, man. This mm. algorithm gets you sucked in quick. Super addicting. Yeah, because we were just looking out. We went to look there for stats, and then we ended up getting sucked in by the first video. Like our, our buddy Dan. I'm, a, I'm an accountant. That's how it started. Yeah, it was one. It was, it was a stripper, and she was you know singing a song. I'm an accountant. So every time someone asks what she does for, for, for work, for a living, she says she's an accountant because no one, you know, if someone says you're an accountant, it's not a big deal. Yeah. You know, but the first one just sucked us in. It's crazy how it sucked us in because our buddy Dan was telling, telling, telling us about this where it's so engaging that it just sucks you in right away. Yeah. And that's so clever. They figured it out. Mm. But on today's episode, we're going to talk about the first artificial heart transplant with the ASN device and the COVID-19 lab leak hypothesis. Fun packed, jam packed, and real quick, if you guys go on our website and check out our songs for this episode, episode sixty one, right? Yes. Of a couple of news, there's a crazy YouTube video about this artificial heart that we're gonna talk about, and highly recommend watching it because it literally shows you how it how it looks and how it works and how it's basically done. So definitely watch that if you're really a visual learner because it's insane. They literally cut off the whole ventricles of the heart and replace them with an artificial ventricular body. Yeah, so this is some a device that got approved by the FDA in 2021, and it was already out in Europe for quite some time. Since 2012, initially was in create this device was created in 28. So look how long it takes before it even reaches like us, mm -hmm. 13 years. And uh, this was for our clinical trials. A 37 year old gentleman, 39 year old gentleman actually, and this was in Duke University, led by Dr. Schroeder. Uh, they successfully planted this patient with this artificial new implant after eight hours the first time they actually tried doing this this was back in 2012 they actually uh the patient died after 75 days oh damn so you know there was a lot of setbacks finally this device got pushed and actually in july this product actually had its first sale in italy so it was sold in italy as a commercial as a commercial artificial heart now and it's the first time that they did it in the united states or did they buy it from italy uh it was given as a clinical trial device oh so they they went to basically went to duke and said hey we got this artificial heart for you guys to to put into somebody right yeah and if you go on the show notes there's actually a whole like 40 minute talk about mm -hmm. uh, reporters talking to these surgeons on how it was and um, things like that so it's very very intriguing and what's what's special about this heart is it actually has a pulse so normally what you're used to is you're used to an LVAD that has just motors spinning this, correct? Yeah, it depends. So your pulse is basically from an aortic valve opening and closing. So for some LVADs, if the aortic valve is still opening and closing, because for certain people, it's the capability of an opening and closing is still there and some blood is able to, to go through through it. Okay. Um, for those, they'll have like a weak pulse. But majority of people usually don't have a working aortic valve. Okay, yeah. And this is interesting. So CarMat's like the, the designer and they're trying to end, basically end stage bioventricular issues like mm -hmm. the, the LVAD that you're talking about. So yeah. like, you know, what this device does is it actually has a heartbeat. So this artificial heart is actually pumping blood. Mm -hmm. And the material that's made out of this artificial heart is actually biocompatible with the blood. So unlike patients, they'd have to be on blood thinners with mm -hmm. this. They don't have to be on blood thinners? No, it's just, I'm mm -hmm. sure they have to be on anti- um, Platelet medications, mm -hmm. and I'm sure this is just clinical trials. So they're going to create their own procedures, but it's going to eliminate the need for coagulating the patient. That would be amazing. Or even if it reduces the, like the, the medication needed to, to reach the proper coagulation time, that would be hugely beneficial too, because the majority of people that have LVADs, the reason why they die is either through from blood clots or basically from, from bleeding. That's basically how, how it works. Usually it's the more, more bleeding because of the whole uh, anticoagulants, cumin and stuff, but it's, if they can reduce that and have this heart working, it's, it'll be pretty amazing. And I watched a video on YouTube and it's a crazy video. It's like almost like pistons 
pushing this this blood as ventricles would do as like your muscles would do your heart yeah it's a very interesting video highly recommend checking it out and they it's literally like they take out the ventricles of your heart they cut them off and then they get rid of them and they put like an artificial almost like a sack looking thing that has a bunch of metal pieces and and pistons and stuff like that and it works that's the way it works and i think there's like there's a is there, is there like a bag connected to them yeah so it just like an LVAD, you still have batteries and things like Power that. Power device. And I think it's up to nine pounds. Mm. So the, the reason why this has a pulse, there's like a pump that's pushing this fluid in. So you're carrying a nine pound bag with some extra batteries because you'll have only four hours on this device. So Without the, power? With, well, four hours before you have to switch the batteries. Oh, okay. You have two, so you could probably you know walk around for eight hours a day. Then you got to get plugged back in. Mm. So, unfortunately, batteries are one of those things that haven't been involved yet with technology. Mm -hmm. Like, we're still, still using lithium batteries, and that's as far, that's as good as it's getting. Yeah. You know how there's, like, the, like, we had these ideas, or maybe, like, back when you were younger, like, these sci-fi movies where they would have people plugged in to certain things? Some people have to live plugged into machines, especially these LVADs and artificial heart. Like, it's crazy to think about it. Because you don't really see it in society unless you're in a medical field working with those kind of things. Like I never knew an LVAD existed up until I, I started working with LVADs. I've never seen an LVAD up until I started working with them. And I never knew that somebody's life relies on batteries or an outlet. Yeah, just imagine forgetting to plug yourself in and you go to sleep. Yeah. You wake up dead because your motor ran out. Well, usually there's like a giant loud alarm. Okay. Like it's the loudest thing in the thing. Like when that goes off, everyone's hearing it. Okay. It's, it's That's how bad it is? Loud alarm. alarm. It's like... It's literally, it's a beeping noise, but it's just so high pitched and so loud. The whole unit hears it. The whole unit, literally the whole, the whole floor. You better run to that room. Yeah. And if there's open doors, the other unit's going to, going to hear across the, the hallway for sure. If the doors are open, it's that loud. It's because, you know, it's low, low power. So it has to wake up if you're sleeping and it has Jeez. to be some, that kind of alarm, but it's just crazy. It's almost like looking, if you look at somebody, they literally have a cord sticking out of their abdomen. You think it's something in, from a sci-fi movie. Yeah. It's wild, man. And and while that this kind of you know kind of technology exists, mm -hmm. so heart failure is an actual global pandemic. So some stats, there's approximately 26 million people, and it's actually increasing. And approximately five percent of the population has heart failure, where it's end of life. Yeah, you can't reverse it, and usually this is the patients that need to go on these bioventricular devices. Yeah, for sure. The end stage is obviously different stages of heart failure, and sometimes you could get it with PO meds. Then of course, you know, you keep adding on the meds, then you have to go to heart failure clinic. Then eventually you get dependent on inotropes and your basically goal of end of life if you have heart failure is to either A, get a new heart or basically B, if you want, qualify for the LVAD and take the LVAD route or now, maybe maybe not now, but maybe in the future you have this artificial heart that Duke is experimenting on, might be your third choice. Yeah. And with these LVADs and these hearts, I'm not sure with, with this one exactly because we didn't look super deep into it. Because I'm curious if this is a permanent solution or just like a bridge to transplant. No, this is a bridge to bridge? transplant for okay. some if it takes, you know, over five years. So it could extend like the quality of yeah. life. Yeah, because with, with LVADs and people with this artificial heart now, there's two moda, like there's two, you could say care modalities. A is going to be permanent, which is they're going to have it in them for basically the rest of their life. And hopefully that extends their life more than the heart failure would, you could say, for example. Or B, which we just talked about, is a bridge to, to transplant, which is you have this thing in you temporarily. Once there's a suitable donor and you're approved for the heart transplant, then you would get the machine taken out and the new heart put back together yeah. or put back in you. Crazy procedure. Something that you don't really hear about or, or talk about too often, especially nursing school. You never even heard about this kind of stuff. Like That's the, yeah. yeah, nothing you actually really, really see or or come in contact with until you're actually in, in, in the scene. Yeah, and one thing that these surgeons also said about this device is it's way too large. So mm -hmm. that's the only drawback with this where they might not consider this device for smaller patients. Just the, just the you could, just like you said, you just literally cut the ventricles to put it in compared to the other modality. So hopefully maybe the future generations of this, this device when it gets better and you know the, the micro mechanics mm -hmm. on it gets smaller, they could put it into smaller patients. Yeah. Have you noticed how much? Do you know how much it weighs the artificial heart? Uh, that I don't cool. have notes for now. It's probably it's probably interesting. I know I'm, I'm not, I don't know how much it weighs, but it looks like a giant project, and they are they also give you artificial valves as well. Yeah, and it's wild because there's microprocessors that are attached to like the valves that are like sensing the device, mm -hmm. so the device is acting based on the needs of the body. 
Yeah. Imagine that's such advanced technology. I wonder how it calculates that. Does it calculate like the CVP? I wonder, or like the volume? I don't know. I wonder how it calculates that. We gotta it. get this guy on the show, man. Yeah, we should. Maybe, you know, push a product here or something. Yeah. Artificial hearts for your grandparents or something. We're gonna get the Carmen design and developers on to yeah, talk the about it. Make something in a, in a Matt's spare room here. Yeah, and so, so, so far the device is not approved in America, just mm -hmm. clinical trials, but in Europe it actually got approved for bridge patients who are in need for a heart tra transplant and have that 1 at 180 day window. Mm. Damn. Yeah, it's probably crazy. I wish I would have been there just to see how this thing actually like, looks. It's, it's different when you look at it from like a picture versus actual re representation because when I, I, I got lucky enough to see a heart transplant when I was when I, when, I, when I was a nurse basically orientating. We had one OR day as like a new grad. They don't do it anymore. And I think I stopped it the year after I got hired, which which is which was so clutch. So you basically Good spent you. yeah, you basically spent one day in the OR and you know, whatever procedure they have that day, you pick one and then you go with it. Nice. And for me it happened to be a, a heart transplant where they took out a heart with an LVAD and they put a new heart in. So it was that bridge to trans to transplant. And like the like I showed you the picture before, like it's crazy. The heart looks it, like the heart that they took out with the Elvad was like three or four times the size of an actual human heart. And the heart was how enlarged it was. Yeah, how atrophied it was, or not atrophied, but how uh, how much muscle was put on there because of all the compensation it ha had to do. It's just it's crazy though. Yeah. Yeah. Ready for the next topic? Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, opinions. You know, this is gonna be an interesting topic. So he's like hard to talk about this when people are listening so let's roll with this so COVID-19 lab leak hypothesis just a year ago you know the news was were saying that scientists are discrediting any conspiracy theories on a potential lab leak in Wuhan mm. you have news like in May 27 saying scientists want don't want to ignore the lab leak theory they want to investigate more into it so it's wild how crazy the news have shaped within a year the discussions that we're having now when back then you were getting taken off the web for saying the wrong thing. Yeah, and the crazy thing is it's coming from like the science community. Science, research, all that's all about exploring every possible situation, every possible question. You're basically trying to find the facts, right? And I feel like during the pandemic, especially when this was brought up, the, the Wuhan lab leak theory, it got shut down right away. But as like a scientist, aren't you supposed to explore all the avenues and and push to get all the facts from 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 every possible source or, or opinion? That's like the best route to go with, right? Let's see what could have happened and expl let's explore each situation scenario. And they basically kind of swept this one under the rug and didn't really fully look into it. And now it's coming up to fruition that hey, this will this could have actually happened. Yeah. And all politics aside. Was it because the last administration was in power? I mean, probably, but you know, we're looking at it now. I mean, kind of late, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, this is just a perfect example of mainstream media, the power of news and what it does. Science, where we believe science is the golden standard and science is science. If Unbiased. It's, if it's evidence, you can't prove it wrong, but all this went on from social distancing to masks and you name it, there was so many different things. We all as a society lost trust in science. Yeah, I think it definitely, whatever happened to the science community, whatever penetrated the science community, it basically won during COVID-19 because there was so much unknown stuff. There was so much misinformation. There was so much opinions getting shot down and it, like things weren't done properly. I feel like there was a protocol in, in play and nobody, nobody followed it for whatever reason. The scientific community, I feel like, ignored their own way of doing things. And maybe it was for a political reason, financial reason. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not going to point fingers. But I feel like the standards that the scientific community upheld up until the, the pandemic, they just went away. And they, for whatever reason, for whatever influence, for whatever circumstance, I feel like science failed us. You know how, like, there's that one scientist that he talks about it's scary to publish some journal articles is it weinstein where some people could discredit you and make you look bad mm. just like there's nurse bullying in a sense there's probably a scientific way of hating people and they probably couldn't agree to um 
look into this mm-hmm. theory whether it's actually you know truth including censorship and then everybody believed it was like this anti-china thing mm-hmm. and you're racist against china because of how politicized it was and because it was politicized it was used as a tool by news to just sleep sweep it underneath the rug and not focus on the proper things yeah. it, it was you know a giant hollywood show instead of publicly looking at the facts mm-hmm. yeah frida don't don't know or are not sure what the wuhan lab theory is is basically saying that this COVID 19 virus originated in a lab and somehow it left that lab and in, entered the public sphere and then it spread the main reason being is because a lot of scientists and researchers were saying that this origination of the COVID 19 came from some kind of an animal that this virus was able to mutate and change its ability to not only affect animals but also affect humans yeah. and so it made it very you know very dangerous and very deadly to people because it was able to hop between an animal and humans so the transmission rate is is through the roof right and it's airborne too they were saying or droplet you know we're still probably unsure about that one as well yeah and what's interesting is a few weeks ago the biden administration announced that dr fauci is going to ask to release the official records of the hospital so in november of 2019 those three officials that were at the the wuhan lab mm-hmm. that had to get hospitalized so they wanted to get information on the staff members the blood samples they were taken the access to the bats there the virus samples and of course there's resistance that's being met yeah i and think china said they're not going to release any information anymore no and they actually got shocked at who pushed for an investigation yeah and what's crazy is we talked about this like a few months ago or maybe like eight months or so a little maybe a little bit more um and it's something that you know we always kept in mind but people swept it under the rug and what's crazy is the people that were involved in this the people what blew my mind was that the people that were the head of the lab were in a connection and friends with the people that were sent to investigate the lab yeah so they had the common everyone that was investigating the lab had a common goal with the lab to continue the research there so they were all basically collaborating together so obviously that's not a good idea to go investigate if if matt's gonna investigate something you're not gonna send me to investigate matt because i'm gonna take his word for it you know i'm, I'm his buddy so hey man you commit that murder he's gonna tell me no then i'm like all right he didn't fucking do it you know yeah. and if you, if you have finances involved and all that throw that, all that in there and an interest you know that makes for a nasty situation and of course you're not going to bash on something, something that you're part of or that you have financial interest in right yeah and this really swept the news back in may so we could have definitely made an episode about all this in may and i i just didn't feel ready there was so mm-hmm. much going on there was especially with the fauci emails that's when things really took a turn and that's when this lab leak theory really started whistling in may and um, the emails were even from Christian Anderson, which was a huge advocate. He was a virologist from San Diego, one of those labs there. And he was discussing that SARS-CoV-2 is engineered. Hmm. And he says it's a, it's unusual feature of the virus that makes up a really small part of the genome, which is 0.1%. And if you take a look, there's a lot of features that potentially looks engineered. And he said in that email that... It, you know, after the discussion earlier today, Eddie, Bob, Mike, and myself all find the GMO, genome inconsistent with exceptions from evolutionary theory. Mm-hmm. So Fauci already had this email in February and no one pushed for an investigation. Yeah, and the whole thing. So Dr. Fauci is basically, you could say, a big player in the NIHS, um, you know, people that all do all the research and stuff. And they give funds and grants and money to research labs. And the NIHS was giving money to the Wuhan lab. And I'm which, gonna, which I should okay. just go into the numbers now. You go into numbers. So, and, th- and this was the conflict of interest mm-hmm. that you were uh, bringing up. The, um, the guy that was supposed to lead the investigation to investigate the lab, Peter Dashak. So he led the investigation and he's the same guy that owns the corporation, or not corporation, it's actual a foundation, Eco Health Alliance, mm-hmm. that has been channeling money that was donated from Fauci from NIH and the Pentagon over $40 million to the stage uh, four lab there. And, you know, that's like, okay, you know, if you want to give money to these labs, 
But the reason why this is an issue in Wuhan is because they were conducting gain of function research, which is basically research on viruses and different bacteria and anything that could really kill us. And we're trying to make it stronger and more resilient to certain things, able to affect people more, just so when it happens, we kind of know how to fight against it. That's gain of function research, is making viruses and things stronger than they already are. And in legally, you can't do gain of function research. And the NIHS shouldn't be donating or giving funds to labs that do this because you're not supposed to do it. I think there's only two places in the world that allow gain of function research, and one of them is in the US and one of them is somewhere else. Very and fascinating the only fact. And that's the only one that's supposed to be doing gain of function research. For, but that's all collaborated on like a worldwide level, not not necessarily on just a nationalistic, just one country basis. Yeah. And what, but on, so you know the thing on the news when Ron Paul, they're going at it with Fauci. Mm -hmm. So Fauci is denying this gain of function research that's, that was taking place in the lab. But if there's a podcast, then, you know, in order to do this podcast episode, guys, like you got to go down a rabbit hole and look up some stuff to understand. Yeah. That guy, uh, Peter Daschak, he, he was actually caught on camera flaunting about gain of function research hmm. and it was dated back back so he's the guy that's leading the investigation that was doing state-of-the-art genetic manipulation to help with virus pass you know like they're they're using mice that are humanized genetically modified to see how this virus could increase transmissibility to help with vaccines so it's there's such a conflict of interest there that already should have put, you know, ask us questions of why this is happening. Exactly. And like when I, wa when I watched the, the court hearings with, with Dr. Fauci um, and whatever congressman asked him the questions, the way Dr. Fauci speaks, it's he's trying to, when they ask him about the gain of function research, Dr. Fauci says it's not gain of function research. And he explains that research that they do. I mean, to me, it sounds like gain of function research because the way he explains it is they are manipulating different viruses to be able to infect things more which technically is gain of function research, right? Yeah. And it's crazy because, but it's one of those, it's one of those things where it's just, it's good to do gain of function research, but to what extent, right? Because you kind of want to be able to see how certain viruses mutate and what they could potentially turn into. That That's like, I feel a positive aspect of gain of function research. It is because you're trying to create better vaccines that are, that could, you know, we, we're trying to eliminate disease. Mm. So it is, it is all for the better, better, and unfortunately, it could have been just a mistake, but no one owned up to it. Exactly. And if the Chinese government covered it up for them, you know, everything was taken care of, that, that's okay. But there's some repercussions that should be taken care of, potentially closing the lab or having stricter restrictions on a national level. Yeah. The whole entire world, just like after World War II, they did the treaties, they fined Germany and things like that. The whole world got taken care of. Problems are fixed. Well, if there's a global pandemic that got caused by a lab leak, and not to mention lab leaks happened before in, in history, let's just learn from this mistake. Let's all be civilized adults, not blame. Instead of our governments are creating propaganda from both sides, when you look at even the Chinese news, because I d was doing some digging for their own gains. Yes, it seems like a giant waste of time if you think about it, because during this whole time and still now, we are trying to figure out how did this COVID-19 virus come to be, right? We've basically been looking forward, we've been looking for the past year on how this virus came to be, right? Instead of looking forward, hey, we know what happened. Let's make sure it happened again. Yeah, let's learn from it. Why not? Right? And that's the crazy thing. Like just shit should have been done differently. Now it's just like a giant big fuck you to the face because we're never going to find out where it came yeah. from. And, and aside from the, the drama that's happening here on a world scale, look what it did to the people. Not in like the psychological way, but to the point where it became so polarized, we couldn't talk about it. We're, we're, right now, we're having a civil conversation about this. We're open-minded. Did it happen at, at, you know, in the lab? Who knows? We're just talking. But it became so polar, you know, polarized, you, you can't talk to your neighbor about, neighbor about this. You only could learn from trusted sources and parentheses, whatever that means. They polarize and, and basic opinion. Yeah. They pol literally polarize common sense and basic opinion. Because if a virus gets released from somewhere and there's a research lab not too far away, common sense is going to probably tell you, hey, let's maybe trust the lab a little bit, little bit more in detail, in depth, instead of totally discrediting it because 
you know, people were being called racist because they're saying it originated in China. It doesn't matter where the hell it originated from. It doesn't matter where it originated from. Let's figure out what the hell happened. Just own up to it, be honest what happened. And like it matters to move forward and make sure this doesn't happen again. Like yeah. it's the craziest thing in the world. And I don't understand how this, how this like happens. But of course, imagine if something got released from the United States. It would be, be a giant ordeal. Like how would the world handle that? And that's exactly what the Chinese papers are publishing. So this is the Beijing counter hypothesis to it. They're, you know, they're... Let me look this up. I have it right here. So Fort in 2019, Fort Detrix, which is also a bio secure laboratory stage four top security clearance in uh, Washington, I believe, got shut down from the CDC for violating uh, some dangerous material disposable policies. Right. Mm -hmm. So it got shut down, reopened back up in April of 2020. And this was the main topic in China. So the hashtag Fort Detrix in a mm. Chinese app in Webio got 270 million hits. Damn. So usually, and the usual theme on this Twitter app was that U.S. is hiding bioweapons and researching deadly viruses. Yeah. It, it sounds exactly like the news that's on our TV, yeah. except the agenda's completely switched. Yeah. Because one of the theories is, as well, the China said that we brought it over to our military. Which, you know, hey, that could, that could be a tool, you know, that's, we should probably look into that one too. If, you know, if, if we haven't, or maybe if we did and we, we disproved it, then it, that's fine. But we can't have a biased opinion on these kind of things. Yeah. Especially if, if it's a worldwide occurrence. Because not only are Americans dying, you know, Chinese people died, people in Europe died, people all over the world died. Yeah, and I'm sure they're good people. Yeah. It's just, it's just their government that's messing things up. Yeah. And I actually went on the Global Times in China. And what they were quoting in those articles were a combined more of 8,000 pieces of news reported related to the lab leak theory. And the Global Times found that 60% of those articles were covering that the U.S. did the, did the leak. Damn. So it just shows you how propaganda is an effective tool. Dude. On, on both sides of government. You can't blame them. But it's just sad to the point of what they're, how they're doing it. The, the polarization... You can't trust anything but just the, the the media. You can't talk about this because it's misinformation. It's bad for you. So let's just get it from one single source. Blows my mind. That's straight up censorship. There's censorship going on everywhere in the world. Who knows if sometimes I, I look at the news and I and I look at it. I'm just like, I don't even know if this is true. Like this has, has to be fake. And you, you don't even really, you can't even really tell what the facts and the fiction are on, on news. And it's crazy because you don't really know what's going on in a country until you actually go into that country. If you think about it, same with like yeah, certain North states. Korea and all that. Yeah, you could see like different stuff on the news about California, about Washington, about you know Nevada or whatever state you want to name. But you're not really gonna understand what's going on there until you actually go into that, into that state or that country. You know, it's it's crazy, and that's just you know power of you could say you know the media and also the power that censorship has because if you have one source that only reports on information outside of the US, that source is gonna provide basically whatever information it wants and there's not gonna be anything to really look back and make sure it's telling the honest truth. That's why independent journalism is a big thing, but it's a dying thing because you have these giant media companies, which is you could say is focused on on viewpoints provided to them by their superiors. Yep. And then you have independent journalists that go into these places and are, you could say, funded by the, the public or, or people that want to change the world. And they're actually showing you things that are contrary to what the other media outlets are telling you, telling you what's going on. And it's taken down and they have a hard yeah. time getting to people like us. Yeah, that's why censorship is never a good idea. I know there's some certain things that we could agree on. We mentioned before, like, like rape, pedophilia, those things shouldn't be anywhere. But we could all agree on those things, right? I feel like everything beyond that, beyond these these points that we could agree on, we should all be able to figure it out on our own. Yeah. The common sense is going to tell you racism is bad, right? Common sense is, is going to going to tell you what what's true and what's not, and that's how things should be. You should be able to. You should you be should a censor of your own information. Yeah. You should be open to exploring it. Yeah. Like we become, we became so sen sensitive to everything. Mm. We became like babies, so we can't even have it like showed in front of our screens. As, yeah. as bad as that sounds. We also have one opinion, but then that, that like destroys creativity and, you know, progression. Because if everyone said that 
let's go back to 1900s, the first Ford automobile. If everyone was, was content at having that, we guess what we wouldn't have better cars, right? If nobody had a different opinion about a car, we wouldn't have different cars. So that's, that just shows you, you can't just have one opinion and one way of thinking because there's no room for growth there. No one's gonna think outside the box, no one's ever gonna change. Exactly, and that's why socialism, as, it's funny, we were on a boat a couple of days ago yeah. and the lady was from Venezuela and she said herself, she ran away from her country because of how bad it was. They're introducing socialism. Not saying that it's coming here, but, but it's, being different is okay. Being an individual, just like we always say that nature and equality, they don't go together. It's, it's a false God that doesn't exist. There's always going to be balances. I know we could fix like systemic racism and things like that, but there has to be that open discussion, just like you say. Yeah. So one more thing though, I, I think in 1977, there was also a lab leak, right? So yeah, throughout history there, there was a few pandemics. There was one in Russia that was due to a lab leak. And then I think that was, a, was about it. The top five yeah. pandemics. Uh, you could say that were similar to, you could say COVID-19. Most of those, four of those came from animals transmission and one of them was, was a leak. Yeah, and this just shows you that human mistakes do happen. Just like you said, in 1977, it had happened. When they investigated the virus, it was, it, it's genetic analysis. The code is missing 20 years. So they know that it was, it, it escaped from a lab because it didn't match the evolutionary theory. Yeah. And yeah, we were able to figure it out and we progressed and things were made safer. Um, virology became, you could say, more, you could say, close to certain experiments. And, you know, I'm not sure how much people died. We, should, we could have probably looked back at how much people actually died and, and, and seen. Because cause think about it. If, During the H1N1, the first one. Right. Because think about it. If we would have known where, where COVID-19 originated from right off the bat, we probably would have had a better chance of treating it and figuring out what to do with it. But nobody wanted to, you know, dis discuss exactly where it came from because everything was everything was like a secret. I, w I wish we as civilized people established that the science community should be able to share information like the virus se sequencing and all that, the genome, without having interference from big governments. Yeah. Because China withheld the sequencing. We couldn't find a little things out. Mm. Just like the Panagonians, right? I think there was a little theory that we thought that it's not from the bats, it's from the Panagonian birds. Yeah. But we we don't have information to it because it's withheld. So here we are just, it's a theory for now. And just like we say, we have no idea, but we're always open to these awesome discussions. Yeah. And that's a wrap. That is a wrap. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know we kind of go off topic sometimes and we go into the crazy side of the world. So thank you guys for mm -hmm. having opened our mind with us. We appreciate you listening this long. Your value is Greatly appreciated. Have a great day, guys. Thank you for your time and keep an open mind. Peace. Peace.